We believe that forgiveness isn't just a vertical line where we say, God, I need your forgiveness, and he gives it, but that you and I are called to forgive one another horizontally, and that our relationships are not supposed to be just good up and down, but left and right. One of the awkward things about church is how do we forgive people who we don't even know, right? It's awkward, and so we just make it easy for you. All you have to do today is turn to your left and to your right, introduce yourself to someone you don't know, and ask them this question, why do you choose this church this morning instead of another one or your bed? You have two minutes. Ready, go. All right, if we could ask everyone to take their seats for a second. When I was growing up and I didn't make it to church and someone asked, hey, how was church this morning? I'd always say I went to Bedside Baptist that, that morning. Uh, but you guys are here today, so you're doing all right. Um, in the bulletin, one of the things you'll find that's next is our pledge campaign. During the month of November, we're taking just a little time in each service to talk about what pledging means and why we do it here at this church. And in your bulletin, you'll find one of these cards which says F First Fruits on it. One of the things that a lot of people don't understand about church, especially if they're new, is there isn't some like magical group of people that run the church. It's not me. It's not like some group far away, and there isn't some crazy amount of money that just sits that keeps this place endowed. It's actually just the faithfulness of ordinary people that have been building this church and helping its ministries flourish over generations. And so what we do uh, during the month of November is we talk about different ways in which your money goes towards things here at our church to help the increase and bless the ministries of the church. And today what we want to do is talk about the property for half a second, because one of the things that's unique about this church is we have one heck of a building, right? in one heck of a location that's extremely unusual and makes us different. Uh, when I was starting here at this church, I always joked around that it would have been way easier to plant a church or to start a new church in a warehouse than it would have been this building. Why? Because when I got here, we had to do mold tests just to check and see if it was safe to have worship in here. Um, those days are long gone. In fact, when you walked in this morning, you probably even smelled a happy smell. Well, that's because we have a company that comes in that sprays and makes sure that everything is really nice here. Since I got here, the transformation of this building has been incredible. Uh, back there where you see, can you guys wave the sound booth people back there? The sound booth people, I mean, that sound booth didn't exist when I got here, but now every week we've got sound. It used to be up in this little corner, and Martin Mola was like a little Christmas elf that would run things behind the scenes. It was pretty amazing. Uh, all these carpets are new, even the lighting's brand new, which is pretty amazing. And there's been a million other improvements that have happened since we got here. Uh, when we had Hurricane Irma, one of the things that most people don't realize is when the damage comes to our building, there's there's no magic groups that pays for it unless it's insurance. Um, our deductible here is roughly $300,000, and we only had $100,000 worth of damage, and so who pays for that? It's our church. It's just us. And so, like, things you'll notice right above me right now, there's a lot of mold. We had a lot of water that came in through the roof up there and damage around the building, and our fences were down and all that stuff. But I just want you to know that one of the things that we take very seriously here at this church is maintaining this property. Not because we think our job as a church is to take care of a building. It's just a building. And if it fell down, we could still have worship right here. We even had worship in a tent not too long ago. It was terrible because it was a clear tent and it was a hot day. But the point is this. The church is us, the people, not the building. But why do we care about the building so much? The reason why we care about it isn't just because it's historic and because it's useful and good, but because this is an incredible tool for ministry. It's an incredible tool for ministry. Every single week, we can gather right in the heart of Brickell Avenue. And I always like to joke around that Joel Osteen couldn't buy this place if he wanted to. I mean, we get a lot of big church pastors that love to come in here and look at this place in awe, thinking I'd love to do ministry here. And it's true. It's because this place is almost invaluable. Um, I'm so thankful to the generations, generations of people that have come before us that have spent time investing in this place and building it so that week after week after week, people could come here and worship God. 
And so during the month of November, what we're doing is we're talking about pledging. And this is just a sense of where some of your funds go to. It goes towards little things like the landscaping and the insurance, air conditioning. I could not preach here or be the pastor without air conditioning. I'm just letting you know up front. As a chubby redhead, it's a non-negotiable thing for me. Uh, but, but I also know this, that when you give, it goes towards things that matter, that creates opportunity for people's lives to be changed, where people commit their lives to Christ and grow closer to one another in powerful ways. Um, during the month of November, what we're asking is that you would prayerfully consider making a pledge to our church for 2018. It's the way that we do the budget, and it's the way we think through what kind of ministries we can do here. And so here's what we ask, is on the back of this card, you can put your name down and what you're thinking of pledging. And if this is your first time hearing about it today, I'd encourage you not to fill it out. Just think about it. Pray about it. It. Talk to your spouse, or if you're single, just think twice about it yourself. It doesn't matter, because we believe that when someone gives something to God, that that's a spiritual act and not a financial one. There's a financial component, but above all, whenever we give to God, what we're really doing is saying, I don't want things to control me, God. I want to give to you and say thankful to you and say thanks to you first. So that's our pledge campaign during the offering today. Um, not only will the ushers be walking around collecting the offering, but if you feel so led, you can put one of these in the offering plate as well. At this time, though, I'd invite you to turn your attention to the screens for our illumination. Okay, I need something with a lock. Security combination, a password. A password? Yo! You've got prayers. Welcome to the Revelation Superhighway. We bless, no mess. Downloading now. It's good. It's good. This is gonna take a while. One million five hundred twenty-seven thousand five hundred and three prayer requests. I better manifest some coffee. Hola, Juan Valdez. Buenos días. Buenos días. Disfrute un buen café. Gracias, señor. Adiós. Adiós. Ah, now that's fresh mountain-grown coffee from the hills of Colombia. So this is the movie Bruce Almighty. If you haven't seen it, I strongly encourage you to with Jim Carrey. And in this scene, what he's doing is he's acting as God. One of the things that is given to him is he gets to be God for a week. Uh, Morgan Freeman grants it to him, who's always the God character in movies these days, right? But in this movie, what happens is, is he gets all these prayer requests, and he's exhausted trying to answer them all. He says, all right, yes, 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 yes. He can't keep up with them all. And what I want to share with you today is I think that for us, a lot of us think of God that way. That he's too busy to really deal with us. That he's just, his job, God's job, is just to sit around answering little tiny prayer requests every day. Like, can you open up this parking spot for me? Can you help me with this thing? Can you help me with this thing? And our picture of God is someone who sits up there in the sky, occasionally gives us a little bit of notice, maybe answers a prayer if he feels like it or doesn't feel like it, and that's God. That's our view. And today what I want to share with you today is I think God is a lot bigger than what we think. God is a lot bigger than what we think. And the reason why I titled the sermon that is because today we're continuing our series talking about the Reformation, where today we're going to look at an important figure in the Reformation, celebrating its 500th anniversary this, this year. Uh, we're going to look at John Calvin. John Calvin, above all else, was a theologian and a thinker, and very important in the history of this church specifically, who taught us that God is much, much, much bigger than we think. 
He's not just a God that sits around answering little tiny prayer requests, but instead he's a God that is in control of the universe, that made it from scratch, and that knows everything at all times and is guidely wising, uh, guidely, wisely guiding, sorry, wisely guiding the universe toward a goal. So follow with me the scripture text today, which talk about God's sovereignty. Um, you'll find that on page seven of your bulletin. And the first scripture comes to us from Psalm 90, verses one through six. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like new grass in the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but by evening it is dry and withered. And in 1 Chronicles 29, 11 through 12, it says this. Your Lord is the greatness and the power, and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you, and you are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Amen. That's a bigger view of God than what we saw in the video, right? In the video, he sits in front of a computer answering little prayer requests over and over. But here in the text that we read this morning, it says that a day is like a thousand years to God, that he rules everything, that there isn't a single thing in the entire world that he doesn't own, that he doesn't possess, that he doesn't have control over. And today what I want to do is share with you some of the things that I've learned from John Calvin, who taught me more about God's sovereignty and control over the world than anyone else I've ever read. And we're going to go through five different points today, that his work was saturated with the word, that God's completely in charge of my salvation, he's in charge of my life, in charge of my city, and that the whole world is a theater of God's glory. So the first thing is this. John Calvin, who was born in 1509 and lived to 1564, not a very long life, is one of the most important people in the history of Western civilization, and you may not even know his name. We're a Presbyterian church, and we come from a group of churches that are called Reformed. Now, if you're a Lutheran, you know that your church was based on Martin Luther in some way, right? But one of the things I love and have a lot of pride in about being a Reformed church is our church started with John Calvin, but he had at least the humility not to name a church after himself. We decided that above all, we weren't going to be named after a person like Luther. We're not going to be a Calvinist church. We wanted to be a church that was centered on and always focused on the word of God and whatever it proclaimed. And so that's why when you come to a Presbyterian church or a Reformed church, we don't like to put a person out front, even though there is a person in our history. And so one of the things that um, I introduced myself to Calvin is, uh, you know, as a Presbyterian, he started our faith by writing a, a book called The Institutes of the Christian Religion. The Institutes of the Christian Religion. It's two volumes. You can buy it today. When I was um, in undergrad, I had to read it. When I was at seminary, I had to read it. I even had to reread it um, a few years ago because it was the 500th anniversary of his birth. Um, it's very difficult book to work through. It's not easy. Back in my days when I was a very unreformed, unhealthy uh, grad student, you know, I would take a sip of Coors Light and turn a page. That was my only way I could get through this long book every, every time I had to get through it. But here's what I know. There is no book that I've ever read that quotes scripture more frequently than this book. On every single page of this entire two-volume work, you'll find at least 10 to 30 citations of scripture throughout it. One of the things that I've learned through studying the Reformation and through John Calvin is the extent to which you want to have influence or for it to be a God thing, it will also be directly related to how immersed you are in Scripture. It's impossible to be a healthy church or to be a healthy Christian if you don't know your Scriptures. One of the greatest finds of the Reformation was the rediscovery of the Bible. Martin Luther, when he wanted to really change the Catholic Church and bring it into a new place, first thing he did was say, we need to start preaching in the language of the people. We need to start translating the Bible into German. We need to start bringing the Bible to the people, even increasing literacy rates so that everyone can understand it for themselves and read it for themselves. If you want to transform the world, you know, I can say this even 500 years after the Reformation. If we truly want to change the world, one of the greatest and most revolutionary things we can do is introduce people to the Word of God. Why? Because it's a living Word. Because it speaks what's true. And because it has the ability to guide us in ways that are powerful and life-changing. 
I can say that from personal experience, but one of the things you should know about Calvin as well is not only did he write this really important book that helped change the world, but the second thing that he did is he preached a sermon every single day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and sometimes twice on Sundays. I mean, he was so immersed in the scriptures that it was his entire life. He was a young guy. He started out just, you know, not knowing what he was going to do. He studied law in Paris for a while. But then when he heard about Martin Luther, you'll notice that he's kind of a second-generation reformer. He comes after the first wave. But one of the things that he did is he started hearing about the things Martin Luther was teaching, and he actually had a conversion moment where he said that his heart got it, like he was softened, like God spoke to him. And from that moment on, he decided that he wanted to go into ministry. Um, and he wrote this book called The Institutes of the Christian Religion. And one day, when he was traveling through what is now Switzerland, in a place called Geneva, there was a pastor there named Farrell who saw John Calvin and said, hey, you're the guy that wrote that book, right? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, well, all right, we need you to be our pastor. He's like, well, I'm just passing by. I, I don't really feel like I can do that. And out of nowhere, Farrell says, I believe that I've heard a word from God that if you, don't leave, if you don't come and stay as our pastor here in the city of Geneva, that God will strike you down forever and you will go to hell. And Calvin heard this and said, all right, I'm not going to take any risks. I'm not going to take any risks. And so John Calvin became the pastor of Geneva, which is, now, which is in Switzerland, for his whole life. There was a period of time where some of his teaching wasn't accepted and he was kicked out. Um, as the pastor there uh, for a couple years. Every good pastor knows that you get kicked out of your church for a while if you're doing the right thing. Um, Calvin is no exception. But one of the things that happened is over time, Calvin became the pastor of this little city that became one of the most important cities in the history of the world, definitely in the history of the Reformation. Uh, we're going to talk about John Knox next week. John Knox was someone who lived in Scotland, came down to Geneva just to learn about what was happening in Geneva from John Calvin, took that message back to Scotland and started a revolution that helped overthrow kings, which led to actually, in many ways, the formation of this church here in Miami. We'll talk about that next week. But when it comes to John Calvin, I can't emphasize this enough. He taught me, and I hope that he teaches all of us, that if you want to transform the world and transform your life, it starts by really understanding what God's word has to say. Why? Because it's not an ordinary book. If we thought that it was just like Shakespeare, or we thought that it was a great book like Hamlet or something like that, then we would treat it like an ordinary book, and it would be on a library shelf. But here at this church, our Bible is front and center. And every week I teach a Bible study on Wednesday nights, we even have in the back of your bulletin something we call the GPS, your Grow, Pray, and Study Guide, where every single day of the week, starting on pages 11 through 12, you can actually read God's Word along with us as the church and pray and study it and reflect on it. We believe that if you immerse yourself in God's Word, you will find deeper peace in your life and truth and guidance for where God wants you to go. If you've ever felt like you're wandering and you don't know where to go, or you know about the Bible, but you wish you knew more about it, this is a place where you can come and learn more. I've never been to a Bible study where I've left it and said, man, I, I wish I didn't go. Every single time you come, or every single time you sit down and read, you'll find that you encounter God in a powerful way. And I know what it's like to be a person where I feel like the Bible's important, but I just don't read it. There were years of my life where that happened where I would feel guilty every day, my Bible would sit somewhere else and I just wouldn't really read it or I wouldn't really pick it up. You know, and days go by and weeks go by and months go by, sometimes even years go by. But today's a new day. If you really want to transform your relationship with God and really get reconnected to his will for your life, today's a day you can start. The resources are right there in the back of your bulletin as well as our Bible studies on Wednesday nights and I strongly encourage you to um, take part in that. The phrase I want you to learn above all in this series is the phrase reformed and always reforming. Can you say that with me? Reformed and always reforming. One of the things we want to capture with the Reformation is that we are always deeply rooted in the past. We are not like a ship without an anchor. But at the same time, we are always trying to find ways to connect who God is and his message to a new generation. Calvin taught us that the Bible is alive. It's not an old document that just sits dead, and the best people that understand it are Old Testament scholars. Instead, the people that understand the Bible best are actually Bible-believing Christians who pray and listen to where God is leading them. Uh, this is a debatable statement, I guess, but you know there are brilliant scholars that are at Harvard or other institutions who are not Christians, but are New Testament scholars and Old Testament scholars. And they know more about every little detail of the Bible than you and I know at all. They've forgotten more than most of us will ever know. 
But do they get it? I would say no. Because the Bible isn't something that's just about facts. It's a spiritual truth that speaks to us in our hearts in different ways. And if you're ready for your heart to grow, if you're ready for your spiritual life to be transformed, the place that you start is by opening the pages of God's word that came to us. Now, John Calvin didn't just talk about the Bible. He lived it in different ways. And today I want to share with you his main idea that God is bigger than we think. God is bigger than we think. The God we meet in scriptures is bigger than we think. But the first thing Calvin wanted to teach us is that God is completely in charge of our salvation. God is completely in charge of our salvation. How many of you have heard of the doctrine of predestination before? Doctrine of predestination before. It is a controversial thing, and here's what it says. It says this, that if God's in complete control of my salvation, then he chooses me to be saved, almost against my will. Do you believe that God is in complete charge of your salvation or not? It's a big question, right? Well, I want you to know this, that if you read your Bible, you'll find that the doctrine of predestination is scattered everywhere throughout the pages. Even St. Augustine and Martin and Luther and others believed in the doctrine of predestination. The thing that's scary about predestination is two things. One is, is, uh, well, does that mean that my decisions don't matter? And what if God doesn't choose me, right? I remember one time I was in college, and it was a religious college, and I had a good friend at the time that was really worried. And we spent hours talking about this, you know, in one of the dorms one time. She was really concerned that God might not choose her. That if God really is a God that is full of power and gets sovereignty over our salvation, well, then what if he didn't choose me? Have you ever wondered about that before? Well, here's what I I know is I I don't get to talk for God, and I don't really know what he thinks or what he does. But if you are ever worried that God might not love you, I, I, I don't think that that's the way to go, because I believe in a God who calls all people to faith. He calls all people to faith. I don't know who he chooses and who he doesn't, but this is one of the things that's helpful for me as I think about this. You know, the Bible says that, you know, wide is the path that leads into destruction, but narrow is the path that leads to eternal life. And one of the things I like to picture is that as I'm going toward God in my life, I feel like I'm on a journey and I'm walking up this big hill and at the top is this phrase that says, you know, work hard, earn your salvation, try really hard. And so I'll get up to that hill and all my life I'm striving to pray hard, to love God, to, to stretch for him in every way that I can. And then as soon as I get to heaven and I turn around, on the back of the sign it'll say something like, foreordained from the beginning of time. There's this weird dynamic, I think, in all of our lives where we don't understand how much in control of our lives God is in control and how much of it is I'm in control. One of my favorite verses from Philippians says, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you to will and to act according to his good purposes. Makes no sense. Work out my salvation and God's totally in control. You know, it's one of those paradoxes that we don't totally understand, but the Bible is very comfortable putting both things side by side. Why? Because I think that's the way God wants it to be. You know, I have to try and strive with all my might every single day of my life while simultaneously also believing that God is in control. It's a very difficult thing to understand. One of the things that the Presbyterian church messed up over centuries was they thought, well, because God's totally in control, then I don't have to do anything. And we actually became known over time as the frozen chosen the frozen chosen, people who, well, God must have chosen us, but that just means we can sit around and do nothing or sit on our butts and relax, right? That's not at all what predestination is meant to be. The way Calvin designed the doctrine or talked about it was he wanted to give people encouragement. He wanted to say, you know what, the reason why we believe in a God who's sovereign over our salvation isn't to give you fear, but to give you encouragement. Because if your salvation's up to you, that's not a good thing. If your salvation is totally dependent on your ability to keep your faith, well, then you can lose it at any minute. And we know a lot of people that would have lost it already, and there's the possibility at any moment that I can let go and fail. But in the Christian faith, we believe that the reason why we have any confidence in getting to heaven is because we have a God who holds on to us even when we let go. You know, I have a little daughter, and whenever we're in the grocery store, actually, no, we were at Ikea yesterday, even worse. Ikea, well, I'm with, at Ikea with my two-year-old, and every second, you know, she would just, just take off. And she's getting faster. She's two and a half almost. And she would just take off. And I, it's really hard to even, like, keep track of where you are in Ikea if you're a responsible adult with all those maps and turns and angles. But as you're trying to, like, track a two-year-old as she's running through all these things, it was amazing. I couldn't find her. I was running all over the place. But here's what I know is she trusted that no matter where she ran to, I had her. I was always going to be there. At any moment, she could stop, 
look back, and there's this guy frantically running in the background to catch up with her. And all the people are like, who's that guy? What's he doing, right? Um, you know, the reason why I have um, a lot of peace about the doctrine of predestination is because it's not about God controlling me. It's about God holding on to me when I can't hold on to him. So predestination is never meant to be a scary doctrine. It's meant to give us incredible assurance. Now, I don't know who's saved and who isn't, and those debates we can handle for another day or a good pub theology. But when it comes to the doctrine of predestination, the reason why it's a good thing and the reason why it's in Scripture is because it's meant to give us assurance and peace. That even when I have a bad day, it doesn't mean that's my last day. That even when things aren't going well in my spiritual life or I haven't picked up that Bible in a long time, what it also means is that God hasn't let go of me yet. If salvation's truly by grace... If it's by grace, meaning I can't earn it, God doesn't owe me anything, God's not in my debt, then God has to be in control of the whole process. Now that can be a scary thing if you think God's bad. But if we truly believe that God is loving, predestination is one of the greatest assurances of faith that we could possibly have. Now the second thing I want to talk about is this, is that God is in complete control of our life. God's not just in control of our salvation, but if God's truly God, he's bigger than we think, not this little teeny tiny God that just answers occasional prayers. It also means that God's not just in control of our salvation, but of our entire life in general. And this can be a scary idea, because most of us like a God that's small. We like a God that kind of blesses me on Sunday morning, that makes me feel really good, so I start my week off on the right step, and then I can just go and kind of live my life like normal when I leave this place. But if God's really God, he's bigger than that. God's not just the God of Sunday mornings, but of Monday afternoons and about Tuesday mornings and about Wednesday nights. Every single part of our day, of every single part of our life is a part that God says, you know what, let me in. I'm in charge of that too. God's in control of our marriage and our dating. We like to think sometimes that that can be our thing, but God actually has a role in that as well. That our work is just our work, but God actually says, you know what, I want to redeem your work. I want to be a part of that too. Even your free time isn't your free time. Your free time is our time. Time for God and I to renew ourselves and to strengthen ourselves. God's the God of our spending, of our friendships, of our internet history. There isn't a single thing over which God doesn't look at it and say, I want to be a part of that. Not because God is needy, like some kind of uh, you know, relationship partner who needs to be involved in everything. God is just there because he wants to be. And also because he's God. Did you know that there's nothing he doesn't see? There isn't anything that we can hide? If God's truly God, then he's, he knows every thought before we even say it or a word is on our lips. Now, that could be scary. I'm not sure if I want a God who's involved in every single part of my life. That seems weird, you know? I'm not sure if I signed up for that or if I want that. But this is the invitation God gives us when he says he wants to be involved in all these parts of our lives. I want to introduce you to the idea of redemption. God is in this process of making the world redeemed the way that it's supposed to be. If you had to summarize the whole Bible in one sentence, I've said this a hundred times, but I'll say it again. If you had to summarize the whole Bible in one sentence, you would say, God made it good, it fell, and he's going to make it good again. That's the story of the Bible, that it fell in Genesis, and that it's been messed up, but that God, through Jesus and all the way through Revelation, he is going to get it fixed. It's even going to be better than the way it was at the very beginning. Did you know that God wants to do that with every single part of our lives too? So not only does God save me and love me and give me salvation, but at the same time he says, Chris, you know, I can heal your marriage too, if you'll let me. Did you know that all your frustrations at work, if you'll let me into that, I can bring some peace to that. You know, your messy family situation that you don't even like to talk about, or that thing that happened in your past that's too dark or too bad that you don't think is even worth talking about, let me in. I can redeem that. I can take all the broken things and all the messed up pieces and like a puzzle, I can put it all together in a way that is beautiful and glorious and truly redeemed. Where you'll look back on your life and not say, that was all messed up. You'll look back and say, God took that messed up stuff and did beautiful and amazing things with it and I'm so much better now than I ever dreamed I could be. God wants not just to be the God of Sunday morning, but the God of everything, not because he's a control freak, but because he wants to show off how much healing and how much peace he can bring into every single aspect of our lives. So God is bigger than we think. He wants to be in control of our lives. And one last thing I'll say about it 
is, you know, even the difficult things in our lives, the troubles that we face, we tend to want to blame others or maybe blame ourselves or sometimes even blame God for those things. One of the things that I do believe is I believe that in the tough things that we face, and all of us right now in this room have something we could just, that came, comes to mind when we think of a challenge we're facing right now. Even in our challenges, I believe this, that God sends those to us as a way to shape us and form us. I don't think that God is a distant God. Even our problems in our life, God sends us in a way because he wants us to grow and learn from them. I've learned this many hard times in my life. Um, It's a hard thing to say. But I don't believe that God is weak or unsovereign. I think we have two choices when we think about God. One is, is God sovereign and in control of things? And we have to trust him in difficult times. Or God isn't in charge of things and we're up to our own to try and fix them. What option would you rather have? You know, with this side, it's tough because we look at shootings and mass murders. And we say, God, how can you be in control of that? But on the other side, if God's not in control, we look at those mass shootings and other forms of suffering and we say, this world's just a messed up accident and I wish I could fix things, but I don't know how. You know, one of the things that I've learned is I really do believe, even if I don't fully understand, that God truly is good and loving and in control of the universe. And I won't understand until maybe I'm dead and God has revealed everything to me in some different way. But I really do believe that God is working toward a goal of, sh- of redeeming the entire world. I don't know how, but it's one of my bold claims as a Christian pastor and as someone who's been living in the faith for a while. So the next thing Calvin taught us is that God isn't just in control of my salvation and in control of my life, but he's also in charge of my city. Here's the big idea, that if God is bigger than we think, he doesn't just care about me, he also cares about our culture and the places that we live in. For example, when Calvin was the pastor of Geneva, you know, he reinterpreted the Bible so that you could have small business loans. I don't know if you ever knew this, but in the Middle Ages, loans were against the law because you couldn't charge interest to anyone, and that's why there were Jewish banks that the Roman Catholic Church would use so that they could have loans done in different ways. But Calvin said, you know, the reason why you weren't allowed to have uh, interest in the Old Testament was because it would take advantage of poor people. But he said, you know what, here in Geneva, the way we take advantage of poor people is by not giving them access to a low interest loan so that they can grow their businesses and do good things. So Calvin interpreted the Bible in such a way that he thought was consistent with the word of God, but also in a way where it led toward greater prosperity and blessing of the city of Geneva. While he was there, he did more than that. He also established healthy food laws so that people wouldn't get sick. You wouldn't think a pastor would be involved in passing food laws. But he helped establish the silk trade in Geneva and built factories for clothes. And up until the mid-19th century, Geneva was known for like its amazing fabrics and silks, all because of Calvin's church. He helped negotiate treaties with other nearby cities and build hospitals and shelters. And so for, in Calvin's mind, he thought this. There isn't church here and the government here, and then my house over here. You know, all those things sit under a larger umbrella called God's in control of all things at all times. And so, you know, the two things you're not supposed to talk about in polite dinner conversation are what? Church and politics, right? Calvin did the opposite. He said everything is on the table because God's in control of everything, and that's a controversial thing. What would it look like if we as Christians here in the city of Miami took that seriously, that God isn't just in control of this building, but in control of our entire city? I remember my very first week here, um, we got an email that the Occupy Wall Street were protesting against the Bank of America building, and they wanted to set up shop here in our parking lot. And, it, and that quickly you know, got my attention because I didn't want to you know, get typecast as one kind of church or another. But I also didn't feel like at the time that it was healthy for a church to just sit on the sidelines and not make decisions. I won't tell you what we did, but that was a tough decision we had to make. Um, This week, just this week, I was sitting at Starbucks um, in the Grove that's kind of near my house. Um, I'm from Seattle, and so that's where I feel most at home is at a Starbucks. And I'm sitting at the Starbucks, and there was a bunch of developer people that were sitting at a table next to me. And they didn't really know that I was there, but I could kind of overhear some of their conversation. Kind of a shady thing to do, but I thought, you know what, this could be a sermon example someday. Um, so, So I'm listening to these folks talk. And they're just a bunch of normal developers. They look like anyone you'd see walking down the street. And they're talking about how they wanted to buy this building in order to rip it down and turn it into something better. And they were talking about this old lady who was there 
who didn't really want to sell and they were plotting ways that they could get her out of her home or trick her out of some kind of legal maneuver so that they could finally get her out of there and move her on so that they could build the building that they wanted to build. And I'm just sitting there like typing away, pretending to type away, right? And I thought to myself, man, I, I wish, I wish that there was a first Miami person at that table who said, you know what, is there any way that we can make sure she's treated fairly though in the process? Is there any way maybe we could do both, where we could do what's right and also move this project forward? Because I believe that it's impossible to be a faithful Christian just on Sundays if it's not applying to every single Starbucks conversation that you have in your life. God's sovereign, which means he's also in control of those conversations too. My encouragement to every single one of you is no matter what conversation you're in this week, imagine as if God was there and he was listening and he cared about the outcome of that conversation. You know, I, I, one of the controversial things I've done here at this church is I don't take political sides, usually left or right. And so here at this church this morning, there's people that are far left and there's people that are, are far right. And my strategy has been to um, say, okay, what I want you to do is use your own conscience and read the Bible for yourself and go do whatever you feel led to do, but I'm not going to tell you what that is. I'm not going to tell you what that is, because if I did tell you what you should do, we'd probably just have a church of people that thought like me or that looked like me and believed all the same things. I believe God's way bigger than that, but I also believe this. Just because I don't tell you what to do doesn't mean you shouldn't be doing anything. We've got some amazing individuals here that I know that take what they learn in this place and listen to God's spirit and go out into the world to bring God's justice and peace to broken places, that are bringing God's word into every single Starbucks conversation that they have. And I would encourage you to do that. God is truly sovereign over all things, and you are not disconnected from him when you leave this place. And the last thing I'll share is this. Calvin taught me, and, he, and this, he's famous for this, that the world is a theater of God's glory. The world is a theater of God's glory. He says this, there is not one blade of grass, there is no color in this world that is not intended to make us rejoice. When God made the world, he didn't set it off like, you know, a distant thing that he doesn't care about. When he made it, he looks over every single square inch of it and says, isn't that awesome? Man, isn't that guy beautiful? Isn't that puppy adorable? I don't know what God looks at. He's watching YouTube videos all day, cracking up maybe. But the point is this, every single part of our world is beautiful because God made it and he loves it and he has a plan for it. Uh, this last week, I was sitting in my backyard, and it was after daylight savings time, and it gets dark early, and the temperature had dropped. My wife and I were in our backyard just listening to some music, and I had my daughter in my arms and um, just kind of spinning her around. And it was one of those special moments where you realize every single moment is a beautiful thing if you're able to truly see it the way God sees it. If you're able to see every moment the way God sees it, you'd see it as an enchanted moment where the Spirit of God is at work in our lives in powerful ways. We often think that we go about our days as if God's not really there. But the truth is, is God is present in every single breath that we take. And if we're able to see his presence in our lives, it opens it up like a huge, um, wonderful world that we're able to participate in. So when I go about my day, I don't go about it as little Chris Atwood, trying to do his best, trying to get his to-do list done. When I wake up, I say, God, this is an amazing world that you've made. I'm excited to be a part of it today. I ask that you would use me, help me to see all the beautiful things in your world that you've made, and I really am just pumped that I get to be a part of what you're doing in the world today. It's a different perspective, right? Uh, God's up there, and we're the play. He's like the writer and director of this amazing play that he's written, and the history of the world is the play, and you and I are the actors inside of it. It's a weird way of thinking about it, but every day when you wake up, you are an actor in a play that God is directing. Doesn't that change the way you think about your life? God is involved in every detail. He loves you. He's working everything toward completion and has a great plan for your life. I'm thankful for John Calvin for the way that he taught me how big God is. He's not some little God of parking lot prayers, but instead a God who says, every moment of every day, I'm there with you, and I will not be ever in a place where I'll let go of you. For that, I'm incredibly thankful. Will you pray with me? Lord, we give you thanks for those who have come before us that teach us more about your word and who you are. We're thankful that you are a big God, a God who has big plans for our lives and is directing us toward completion redeeming and healing all the broken parts of our lives. 
Bless us this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please remain seated for our offering. Thank you.